morning all and uh, uh, extremely nice to be here again and thanks very much to all the organizers for uh, arranging this and it's a beautiful place. I'm really amazed at the size of the board, etc. And uh, just as uh, any TV serial, it only gets worse. <laughs> so that's part one, part two. Uh, this one. Nivedita had a uh, nice, you know, uh, uh, way of putting it. She said, Munabai, Munabai Lagiraho. So, Lagiraho <laughs> Munabai. So, yeah, okay, so it's the same. It's the same set of suspects, and this one is not yet published, it's in the archive. Um, so yeah, Shashi talked about eigenvalues and fluctuations, and I'll talk about eigenfunctions and especially what happens to the entanglement and localization. I'll touch on localization, but really not much. Okay, so um, I start off with uh, something about entanglement because that's what I'm going to particularly uh, concentrate upon but there have already been talks on entanglement in different contexts, so it makes my life easier. But let me just get into the, you know, the details of what exactly we are talking about. We are interested in eigenfunctions of systems which are strongly you know, coupled, and we want to characterize entanglement in them. And in this uh, talk, I'm gonna just concentrate on pure states, which are the eigenfunctions of these systems, and split the system into two parts. They, each of them can contain many you know, particles, but two parts, A and B, and so it's really bipartite. And then the entanglement between these subsystems, A and B, is really simple because it's a pure state. It's just given by the phenomenon entropy of the reduced density matrices. So this is from an information theoretic point of view, a sort of a unique characterization of the entanglement. You can cook up other measures, but there is a particular information theoretic uh, interpretation of the phenomenon entropy which makes it unique. So uh, if the states are not entangled, for example, uh, they're just products. So pure states are uh, unentangled if they are just product states. It's as simple as that. So if, if, if you can characterize the subsystems with pure states, they are unentangled. Like down, down, I mean, suppose these are spin, spin is, let's say, up. So both the spins are up, or it's a qubit with zero, zero. It's unentangled. And if one calculates this entropy, it will be, it'll oblige and give you zero. On the other hand, there are states which are also maximally uh, entangled like this, where the subsystems cannot be specified by any pure state. And in this case, it's the worst case scenario, and you get the maximum entanglement, which is log two in this case. But in general, for if you have n states in the subsystems, uh, you have log n. So this is the microcanonical if you want, for example, where all these states are equally likely. So the reduced density matrices in this case, where it's unentangled, will be a pure state itself. So the reduced density matrix spectrum, which is these lambda i, will be, in this case, one eigenvalue will be one, everything else zero. And in this case, all the eigenvalues will be equal to one over n. So that's the situation, two extreme cases of unentangled states and maximally entangled states. But the Hilbert space is a big space, and you have this, uh, you can characterize the entire set of pure states by putting a measure on it which is uniform measure, and then asking what is the average or typical entanglement. Quite amazingly, there's an exact expression for it which I will not write down, which was discovered by Don Page with very different motivations. He was studying black hole entropy, but there was also an earlier work by Lupkin, and essentially it says that for large n, the subsystem dimensions, large, suppose you have two subsystems here, A and B, one of them with dimension N and one with dimension M, and N is smaller than M, then the average entanglement is the entropy, uh, is, is log N minus N over 2 M for large N and N. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, yeah, both these subsystems have uh, dimension empty N, and also the entropies are equal. That is the, uh, uh, if you calculate the reduced density matrix rho B and rho A, the entropies of both of them are equal, which is again something which comes from the fact that you have a pure state. It derives back to that. But the interesting thing is that the average or typical entanglement is very large. You see the maximum is log N, this is log N minus N over 2M. So for instance, for large N, uh, 
uh, if n and m are equal, this is log n minus half. And in the context of uh, the talk by Arnab Sen, for example, where he talked about the volume law, if n is the dimension, this is the dimensionality of the Hilbert space, so it's exponential in the number of particles. So this will be proportional to the number of particles. One would say that there's a volume law. So typical states have, in that language, a volume law. But basically, it's maximally entangled, nearly maximally entangled. So entanglement is not uncommon at all. And in fact, most states are highly entangled. It's the dimensionality of the subsystem. The other one. So there's, there's row A and row B. <laughs> so N in general is uh, smaller than or equal to M. Then the entropy is dominated by the smallest subsystem because they have to be equal. So if, for example, if you have a two level system coupled to a hundred level system, the entropy can be maximum log two. Yeah, I know your uh, I know your objection. You have actually studied, you know, the distribution and, and so forth. Yeah, uh, yeah. But what about the width? I mean, the width is also not uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, Right. That is, oh, no, no. See, uh, to arrive at a maximally entangled state is nearly, nearly impossible. Yeah. No, I, I agree. So that's true. There is a gap. I mean, this minus half has to be taken seriously. But then it's still only minus half compared to, you know, suppose you have n which is uh, 2 to the power of 10. It doesn't matter, 10 minus half, 10. So it's typical states are nearly, I would say, maximally entangled. But you are absolutely right. It's not maximally entangled. Um, OK. So, so this is an early work where, uh, in fact, uh, this is exactly the model which was uh, discussed by uh, Shashi. So it made my life easier. So. This, these refer to the uh, uh, to these things. So, okay. So, what what am I interested in? So, this was the uh, this was just a formalism, a general thing about these states. But now, I want to particularly look at systems which are uh, such that when so you, you have A and B to be two subsystems, and when they when they start interacting, uh, uh, there is a generation of entanglement. And then one is interested in knowing this, how this entanglement grows with this interaction. So we could, we could couple two you know, pendulums, and then you know that a coupled pendulum is actually chaotic, and uh, you can look at the entanglement in them. But in this case, the pendula are not, they, they're actually kick pendula themselves. So the individual pendula can be chaotic. So in, in this case, they are not very chaotic to begin with. It's 0 0.1, 0 0.15. In Shashi's example, they were like 9 and 10. So they were very chaotic. So these are not very chaotic. And this n, by the way, this is the number of uh, states in each of these kicked rotors. So they are finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And it should be mentioned that this n is a scale Planck constant. So in, in all of these things, n is 1 over h. Right? So the larger the n is, it's like going towards the classical limit. <clears throat> now, let's take a system, let's, let's say n is 15. Uh, so each of the pendula are 15 dimensional systems. So you have 225 you know, states on the whole. Uh, you uh, diagonalize them numerically, you find the entanglement and plot the average over the entire spectrum as a function of this coupling B. So the, these two pendula are now coupled by this interaction trend B, which is exactly the same as what appeared in the last talk. Then you'll find that with interaction zero, there is no entanglement, although there can be uh, interesting dynamics. And then it increases to this nearly maximum value, I mean this saturation value, which is actually precisely given by this page formula. So it's very close to the page formula. So it oscillates around this, or it fluctuates around this value, which is given by log n minus n over 2m. So this is saying that here, if, if, if these two pendulas start to interact, after a certain interaction strength, the entanglement is typical entanglement. So the states become typical, and they have 
uh, entanglements which are characterized by the average. So if, if, you, if you increase n, the entanglement increases, and all of, all of these follow that thing. And the, but, but this particular transition here, uh, it, 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 we would like to understand this particular transition. So this is understood from random matrix theory. Zero is trivial, but this transition is interesting, and there's really not much understanding. Another con very different context where these things are appearing are many body systems. For example, in this particular paper, Owen, uh, he, uh, the authors have studied an Ising model with next nearest neighbor interactions and an external transverse field, and, uh, um, and the uh, uh, nearest neighbor coupling is a disordered coupling. So in this, in, in this example of an Ising uh, spin chain, if you were to, uh, uh, and, and what is plotted here is the disorder strength in this, uh, in this coupling versus entanglement between now A and B correspond to one half of the spin chain and the other is the other half. So it's exactly the same thing, you have a pure state. These are eigenstates of this Hamiltonian and you're looking at this as a function of the disorder strength. If the disorder strength is very large, there was a talk by Debiendo in the morning, and there's this, like, an, it's, an, it's an MBL phase, it's, uh, it's, you know, localized, and the nearest neighbor's facing statistics is that of Poisson, and the entanglement follows an area law, it's, it's very low, it's low. But if the disorder uh, uh, strength is not very large, but of course it should not be zero as well, if it's zero then it's again Poisson. But if it's not very large, there is a very interesting phase of delocalized uh, states where, Again, typical entropies are obtained. So these are, again, match, these, these straight lines are those page formula, the typical values. So again, it'll be interesting to characterize, to have a theory for this kind of transition from area to volume law, which I think is still not available. So can we characterize entanglement transition? So integrable to non-integrable non transition. Like in the first graph of the pendula I gave, I would characterize it as near integrable to non-integrable transition. General phenomenology of entanglement is lacking. It's complicated by special non-universal features, uh, such as the classical Kolmogorov arnold moser theorem. The phase space is messy. It's got tori and so on. It's a hard problem. Disordered many body systems are currently of large interest, but as far as I know, there is no general theory of these entanglement transitions across, for, for example, a many body localized to ergodic phases. But this is what is the simple part of the thing, and that's what we did. That if the non-interacting systems are themselves chaotic to begin with, then, uh, uh, then there is an apparently simple way to analytically understand this entire transition. So this, for example, if you can, you can consider two uh, particles in a stadium billiard. So you have some quantum dot, you have two electrons interacting in a stadium billiard would be a context uh, in this, because to begin with, the non-interacting particles are chaotic. Or if you take a spin chain, you could consider a spin, uh, spin ladder where each of the chains are themselves in the ergodic phase. And then you can control the interaction between the ladders, it would again correspond to such a situation. So, the model with, so this is the general setting then. This is the usual, you know, there is A and B, Hamiltonian A, Hamiltonian B, some interaction. That's what we are interested in. But we prefer to study the Floquet versions of these, which is what was introduced uh, also by Shashi. These are unitary operators corresponding to system A and B, and then this is the interaction. And this is a random matrix model, which, yeah. uh, thanks. I'm a, I, I will. So I, I think Shashi has uh, explained the random matrix model. We, so I, I will present the results. So what, what we are interested in is you have such an ensemble, we calculate the eigenstates and uh, uh, look at its entanglement. It's zero if there's no interaction. And we increase this interaction to see how this entanglement is increasing. We expect that when the epsilon is large, there is maximal or near maximal uh, entropy. So actually we study not just the entropy, but a whole class of entropies known as uh, popularly as Salis, but introduced 20 years before by Havadra and Sharwad before Salis. So these are all moments of the uh, density matrices. 
So for example, k equals two is the simplest, simplest one. It's called purity or linear entropy. This, this, these are the entropies, these are the moments. And if k is one, it corresponds to the von Neumann entropy or the entangled. For an unentangled state, all of these entropies vanish. And our task was to find sk uh, for this. And as uh, Shashi pointed out, the parameter which is most important in this transition is not epsilon, but it's a combination of epsilon and n, which is h bar. So it's the interaction strength and h bar combinations. This is a, this is a dimensionless parameter. This is what governs the transition. Okay, so I'll just state the results. Uh, so the formulas look really nice and simple. The linear entropy, this is the interaction is buried in this universal parameter lambda. I mean, this uh, parameter lambda, this form is universal. And if lambda is zero, there is no interaction and the entanglement entropy is zero. So this is linear entropy, this is entanglement entropy. And if lambda tends to infinity, it tends to one minus two by n, which is the random matrix, you know, the, the nearly maximal uh, entanglement or the typical one. For example, the von Neumann, the log n minus n over two m appears here in the lambda is infinity limit. The difference between these two is that there is a log n minus half here. So the rate, at, rate of approach depends weakly on the system dimensionality, in the case of the entropy. So there is very simple formulas, and here are the numerical curves. You know, there are, there's a random matrix theory on this. There is a dynamical system model corresponding to what Shashi was talking about, and the theoretical curves, and they are quite remarkably uh, fitting. So there is a theory which I don't have to time to go by, but I'll just say that there is, it's a combination of a regularized perturbation theory plus RMT arguments, and some really strange arguments, which uh, enabled us to arrive at that. Uh, but I think I'll skip the details. Uh, but it has something which is, I, I would say, something like a fragmentation process. Sure. So you have an eigenvalue one, which is because of the, you know, eigenvalue one corresponds to the pure state. As your interaction is increasing, the uh, density matrix acquires more and more eigenvalues. So it's like breaking this one into smaller pieces. And uh, uh, that's uh, the particular way in which it's broken. I think the time is over. I, I've already given you one and a half minutes extra. Sure. I think I should. Uh, I, 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 thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Apologies. To... Any questions? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I mean, I. Yeah, so I mean, just uh, to understand a little bit, then maybe you can explain one, one minute about what, what is this fragmentation? Yeah, so uh, suppose lambda is zero, there's only one, one eigenvalue of the, you know, the reduced density matrix. When you start increasing lambda, there will be a stage when there are two principal ones that you know appear. So there's lambda one and lambda two, that's it. So that can be calculated using perturbation theory. You know, all this regularized perturbation theory, one can do that. So it's like splitting you know, breaking a stick into two parts. And then there is also a distribution for the largest and smallest, which can be calculated. It's interesting distribution. And then as you're increasing the interaction strength further, each of these splits, so what, what's happening is, I think some kind of, you know, resonances uh, when, these, when these levels start coming close to each other. So there's further, you know, resonances. And so here is an eigenstate, what happens after a perturbation. And this one itself splits into two due to a further, further resonance. So, uh, so this is, these are like the lengths of the stick. But now each one of them is broken further. So uh, that's my analogy to that. But it's really actually a, so sort of a recursively applied perturbation here. And then you're asking how the entropy changes as a fragmentation proceeds. Okay, so let So I'll invite the next speaker.